<laughs> so anyway, um, welcome everybody. A, uh, welcome to the um, annual uh, Animation Educators Forum. Uh, this forum started up, like, what was it, about 10 years ago or something like that? Uh, I, I just basically, you know, we suddenly realized there's so many people teaching animation. And, you know, like, like professional animators will hang out with one another and talk shop and trade secrets and stuff. And then, you know, writers will hang out and stuff. And I said, well, there's so many people teaching animation, but the people who teach animation don't speak to one another. You know, everybody's got their own curriculum, everybody's got their own program, but nobody's actually talking to one another, you know, and, and I think this would be fascinating, you know, because I, I, I learned a lot from uh, older animators I know who taught, and, and, and it's not necessarily, you know, tricks of the trade of animation, but also teaching animation, you know, because there are people who are wonderful, uh, uh, you know, wonderful authorities, they're wonderful animators, but they can't teach it. You know, the, the famous story was uh, Milk Call, you know, was like one of the great Disney animators, you know. Milk would stand there with a the chalk and it said, get up there and talk about your technique. And he'd stand there and go, uh, uh, just draw. <laughs> <laughs> that was like Milk teaching, you know. Like, <laughs> while somebody like Art Babbitt was very good at breaking down things into lesson plans and, and, and working on assignments and, and, and you know, he was, he was able to basically take the process and, and verbalize what his what he was doing, and you know, and that's you know, and that's a gift too. So, so we started this forum. Uh, this forum really, it's just it's very loose. Uh, you know, it's 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 not you know we're not going to make you read any strange books or anything, or <laughs> donate all your money to Tom Cruise or something. <laughs> it's like it's just a it's just a, a loose forum, just to kind of uh, uh, hang out, get a conversation going, and we try to work with a topic uh, each year. And uh, just to kind of get the conversation going. And this year, we're, we're, the topic is we're talking about VR. And uh, we've, we're very happy to have two wonderful guests with us to, who are authorities on the subject. Uh, Andy Fadak is the Assistant Professor of Animation at Cal State Fullerton. And um, a regular, I, I won't run down all the data because it's all here. And uh, Eric Hansen, who works with me at USC, he's an Associate Professor. Uh, of digital arts at the School of Cinematic Arts. And uh, so welcome to you guys. You suckered you into being so. <laughs> No, you, you threatened me, Tom. That's right. <laughs> so let's, let's keep it correct. Go, go to my forum. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said I learned that years ago from Chuck Jones because uh, Chuck, like, sponsored a few... Uh, schools like Roland, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Roland Heights and, and uh, Laguna, you know, at, at the Laguna College of Design. And Chuck would like actually call me up at home and go, go give a talk at Laguna. Go, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't argue with Chuck. <laughs> Chuck tells you to go, you, you go. So, so anyway, so let's get into this a little bit. And um, so uh, how do you, how do you, uh, 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 you know, I'll throw it out to the both of you. And everything. Uh, how do you see the uh, the growth of uh, of VR? Because it certainly seems to be the uh, the buzzword lately. Like, like, how do you see like the state of VR in the in the current market? Do you want to? Well, I can give you my story. I yeah, mean, sure. I mean, so there's, I mean, it's, there's, it's really kind of coming to a point in these next say six months as the Oculus is Rift starting to come out. And there's a lot of really amazing technology that. It's really kind of, um, and I, it's really kind of cool that we have Eric here because he's kind of on the forefront of it too, um, where we're moving from the need to render um, in a game engine into more of a render engine like an Arnold or a V-Ray or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so in that, it becomes much more photorealistic because you can resolve over time, you know, m many, many hours rather than one frame every uh, 75 frames a second, right? And so my story is basically, I was more a visual effects artist showing in galleries. And then um, I had my first solo show at a museum and I had to fill it, right? And in that um, problem of not knowing how to make anything in real life, I started to get into VR. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so my background kind of led me to research and figure out like how to you know, adapt animation to this kind of pipeline. And so now there's tools like Presence um, and uh, light field technology where you're able to immerse someone inside of a render where it's in 3D space and you can move your head around and it's kind of like, it's like magical where you don't have the limitations of a game engine as much. 
And I think the and I think Eric could probably talk about this even really well, more than probably a lot of people in the whole world, um, about how that's coming even better in the next six months, ten months, and how as filmmakers the pipelines are really similar where you can see almost the um, the camera is instead of a 2D camera, it's gonna be this this camera that shoots out in every direction that you can kind of see. And then also it's not locked in where you can move your head around. And in that moving your head around, in this volume, it creates this sense of you're there. It's like, it's really spooky. <clears throat> and if you haven't tried it yet, it's like really kind of incredible. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Okay, good. Um, well, I got involved with VR probably about two years ago. Uh, a lot of the work that I do on the side, I have a small studio, and we have been doing a lot of work in what's called full dome, which is like planetarium dome that are retrofitted out for spherical or half spherical projections. So, uh, and I've, we've always done a lot of photography integration with visual effects. I'm a visual effects guy by background. But um, the point is, we were, were we developed all these techniques to work in a sphere, but we, it would always be a half sphere because of the full dome projection and we did all types of science visualization different kind of shots for different film projects that uh, that are in that little subculture um, but when VR is VR kind of started again with the rise of the oculus and uh, which actually was an outgrowth of USC incidentally um, the guy that started oculus was Mark Bolas's assistant and uh, so there's a whole backstory to that but as Facebook finally bought oculus came in you know it's the the were uh, at that time I think the record Kickstarter um, and then followed by Mark Zuckerberg buying it for two billion dollars so once you know his jet engines just took him into the stratosphere um, you know he started deploying some early headsets so we acquired the first one of those called the DK1 and it would, uh, knowing that we had all the chops already developed to work in a sphere, and actually this is really exciting for us because we didn't have to cut it in half, we could actually work in the entire sphere. But uh, now this first unit though, I put it on and I would go green in about 10 seconds. I mean, it didn't matter what the demo was, I was just hideously nauseous. And my business partner has more threshold for that. So he was like, well, I don't see what your problem is. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, this, I didn't, you know, you couldn't pay me to keep that thing on. So, and the resolution was horrible, the tracking, everything about it was horrible. So I put that down, I just said, well, I'm gonna wait and see. And that was about two years ago. It's not that long ago, really, that that came out. And then they put out the DK2, which was the first one that was much higher resolution, went from 1280 to HD to 1920. And then, uh, and they got the tracking worked out. So you didn't get as nauseous. So the world didn't kind of shift on you. So as you whip pan to your head, the world would stay steady or rigid. And that's the, that was kind of, so they started working out some of the technical issues to make it a, quasi pleasurable experience to be in um, and all that stuff had kind of been around in early times you know 15 years ago when VR 1.0 was kind of happening but it was fifty thousand dollars and today because of cell phones because of little uh, you know IMUs little gyroscopes in your phone and the high resolution the high pixel density of the displays that's what kind of broke it open that's what Mark Bullis kind of recognized a number of years ago so anyway, the whole thing democratized what used to be 30,000 is now, you know, 300 for that headset wow. or whatnot. Wow. So, um, and they find, but they kind of had to re-get the tech right. So they got that right about, not that long ago, about a year and a half ago. And then, um, so once I saw the DK2, we got that in, it's like, I could develop for this. I can, I can see where it's going now. There was like a vector because now you had two points and you could see that probably the next one was going to jump up, you know, much further. Right. So what they came out with most recently is the is called the uh, Gear VR, and it's put out through Samsung. I should have brought it today, actually, but it's a uh, uses your cell phone. Um, a Sam, it's a way to to hawk Samsung phones, but that uh, they just released it this week at Best Buy's and already selling out like mad um, for a hundred dollars. So if you have wow. a Samsung phone, you have the highest quality VR right now, which changes by the week or you know month. Um, but anyway, that's out now, and that's what's uh, called, uh, basically it has, it doesn't let you move your head like, it's not, it's not like right. you're describing, but it has position or orientational freedom, meaning you can look in any direction, but you can't necessarily feel like you're in the space. It's kind of a simulation of it, but you have freedom <coughs> to look anywhere. Well, anyway, once that unit came out, that 
the resolution jumped again, the performance got even better, and I got really excited because I thought, oh my god, this is, and th this all happened within two years yeah, or less. So if you extrapolate it, um, I think was it Sony brought out a 4K phone. The phones right now are 2560 uh, with the gear. They're they're already at 4K. Um, Samsung will probably bring theirs at any time. And then I've even heard rumor of 11K phones, which is insane. But so what that means is VR. Right now you can see some pixelization. It's called the window screen, but that's going to disappear uh, within the next year for sure. It's already kind of on the edge right now. So, you know, if you just project two years from now, three years from now, the tech is absolutely there, yeah. um, you know, for pre-rendered. And the other thing that maybe, you know, I don't know how much of any of this you know about, but there's three basic kind of uh, avenues you can work in VR. And this will happen with your students. The, the other big thing we can talk about is how is this going to affect education, which is why we're here. And I think it's going to be massive, actually. Uh, we already have student thesis films being done in VR. Um, I started a VR class last year, and it's, you know, I'm offering it again next spring, and it's just, we're turning people away in droves. So it's the, the interest and excitement is, is there. Um, if you're local to LA, you should go to a thing called LA, uh, or, or VR LA, rather. If you look that up online, that's an event that a 19-year-old film production student started Cosmo <laughs> just about a wow. year and a half ago, or less, probably about... 14 months ago, and it went from the first time it was a, he just it was a meetup group. So he started this meetup group. It went from 10 uh, next month to 100, next month to 1,000. It's now at 4,000 people, and it's at the LA Convention Center, wow. and it's the most amazing thing. So we always put a booth up and kind of show our stuff there. But it's a, it's a great place to kind of see. And, that, and actually now in in uh, Orange County, they have SoCal VR. But uh, San Francisco has a few, Seattle has one, New York has one, um, and I'm sure all points are probably developing these groups now. So um, it's an incredible grassroots thing that's happening. So anyway, but obviously all of our students know about this, and if, or if they don't right now, they're going to, you know, any day now. So the opportunities for this are incredible. But, the, but anyway, back to the three ways you can work. One is with pre-rendering using Maya or Arnold, like you were saying. Um, and then the other, but that's pre-rendered CGI. But I'm doing a studio right now with them where we're taking all their hand-drawn animation into Maya. And we're just representing, we're kind of uh, over-painting uh, 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 still panoramas. And that's the way that I start to teach them is I show them how to do spherical photography. And then we manipulate that and we layer in 2D animation within it. And it's a great, and, and I'm totally excited about what we're getting this semester. I mean, it's like some of the best stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, was just gonna, I was just going to uh, interject that. Sure. You, you know, right now it seems like the stuff that I've seen so far and all, we're sort of like in the Lumiere phase of this technology oh, yeah. where a lot of it is photo real and it's, you know, it's like, like, like you've done stuff in like Red Rock Country and things yeah, like sure. that where mm -hmm. you see it. And, and so like, what's the status of, of artificial environments, you know, or like, like designed environments, uh, you know, in, in, in VR now? Well, the, let me uh, let me just finish on the three types because sure. because sure. that all pools into that. Okay. So okay. one is pre-rendered, and that can be photography. I Anything mean, you can get into Maya, but it could also be hand animation or traditional animation brought in. But now you're surrounding the viewer in it more immersively. Um, but that's pre-rendered, so everything that happens in there, you have freedom or what's called agency to look around. But um, and how do you direct the viewer within that is a whole nother. You know, the storytelling of this is a whole other giant thing to, to work out. But that's one way. The other way is to use uh, a bunch of GoPro cameras that are in a cluster, and that's stitched video would be, or VR video would be the other thing, and that's, um, that's just kind of more cinematography. Um, and then lastly, there's real time, which is uh, what you alluded to, which is using gaming engines like Unity or Unreal. And that, uh, that, that's a fairly trivial thing to go out to if you develop a 3D world in that program to output to VR is, is really just a button away. Mm -hmm. So those are kind of the three things you can explore. And what goes on in the field right now, I would say, I don't know what your guess is, but probably 50, 60% is real time. Yeah, the majority of it's going to be real time stuff because it's already there and there's games that already have. VR kind of connected to it, like EVE Online. And yeah. That's, that's like a lot of people's first experiences with it. 
So as animation, you know, animators, you can work in that world if you yeah, embrace what gaming engines do, um, or you can work in the world of Maya, and whether that's photo real worlds like the presence piece or right, right, right. something stylized, you know, that's that's up to the artist working. Yeah. And then, of course, the video thing probably doesn't really involve us as animation educators as much. Yeah, and just to kind of, so I, my, this exhibition's up right now at Cal State LA. It, it uses the presence, the... And it's a rendered from Arnold, and it's photo real. You put the helmet on, and you're in the gallery. And the gallery has been using kind of photogrammetry mm -hmm. and kind of creating the space it is replaced. So like things like the roof comes off, you know, things you couldn't manipulate in real life. And so you can do whatever you want once you're in that CG side. And I think to me, it's really kind of interesting where you're starting to integrate live action into it and trying to figure out how to kind of combine those spaces. And there's a lot of I mean, there's a lot of really interesting things that happen when people put the, the rift on and they're in a space, but the space is a little bit different. You get into things like the uncanny, and for a surrealist artist, it's really kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think for animation, like that's really, it's, it sounds really cool, like you're, the way you're teaching the class with, I never thought about like bringing in 2D and into, I guess you put it on like cards. Yeah, a lot yeah. Of car or shells, one of the two. Yeah, that yeah. sounds really, so it's just even now, I feel like, from this show, this exhibition that went up, and then just talking about it, just seems really the potential is really there. Oh yeah. For me, I guess one of the conversations we have to have is the optics of wearing this device on our faces. And is that something, you know, is there gonna be a temporal element to how much we can take at a specific amount of time? Like, can we watch a whole movie, you know, wearing this thing? Or is it more of a 10 minute experience, you know, in a gallery, or is it, you know, and I think, for me, it's, I'm still kind of resolving that issue, you know? And maybe it's when, when, because once you, like, there's a lot of people that came to my, the opening that didn't even put on the goggles because I think they were afraid about what they were going to look like to others, you know? And I think once you put on the goggles, it, everything changes. It's like a portal. It's, mm. it's really amazing. It's really incredible. And it's getting just better and better. But it's, there's, a, there's a social dynamic that I think is a huge part of it. it should be a huge part of the conversation you know like, yeah and that's going to evolve tremendously yeah because right now it's a solitary experience and the uh you know as i say my teenage daughters are locked into their phones badly as it is but <laughs> now the idea of them having headsets and checking out is really terrifying <laughs> but, but the point is it, it is a solitary thing but um there's all kinds of r d being done now number one to bring your body back in because it's always odd to look through vr and not see your body or your hands so that's all starting. And of course, once you have agency of your body, then you can start to interact with objects or menus or what have you. So all that's going on. And then number two is bringing others into the same space. So we're working with uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs up in San Francisco at a big uh, laser fusion center that they have that's kind of involves nuclear materials and they can't, uh, there's no way to bring school children or non-U.S. Uh, citizens in. So we're working with them to make a unified VR experience where we could all sit at this table, put on a headset, and we'd all be in the same virtual space wow. together, and either with an avatar or without, but the timing would be correct. So we could have someone who would guide the tour, and we'd enter all these, you know, be able to witness these different spaces, but with a guide who would point things out and gesture and so forth. So that's all happening. There's there's development now on that. And then lastly, which is Facebook's ultimate aim, is the whole thing will be social. So you'll have avatars or others expressed in the space with you. And God knows where that's going to yeah, go. Yeah, they could sell so, the, the customizations of the spaces. Oh, yeah. No, it's that's like huge. the commodification of consciousness. Yeah. It, it's, it's really heavy. <laughs> wow. But just to... Just to to further extrapolate, I mean, everything we're talking about there is got all kinds of implications and avenues of growth. But if you then say, well, VR is just one facet of three areas, one called a VR, then one called AR, which is augmented. Microsoft's working on this right now with the Holodeck and Magic Leap. Right, or Holo, yeah, that's not really the Holo, HoloLens, sorry. And uh, that's where now CG is imparted into the world. And if Google has a thing called Project Tango, which is real-time scanning of the world. And there's plenty of demos you can see now of if you place this headset on, you can have an object appear, but it could dart under this table, and you'd actually have matting uh, you know, in real time of these CG objects. So CG objects will start to inhabit our space 
um, around us and you know in, in all regards so that's AR and the basically the powers that be think that that's even a much larger market than VR and then there's mixed reality we have the mixed reality lab at SC but that's exploring some of these things and that's kind of where now you're doing you know you're bringing other all media basically together in this kind of just interlayered world so it's uh you know where this is going to go is staggering just staggering so um is, is uh I, I know a lot of this uh, you know from from history with, with, with cg i noticed that like a a, a lot of stuff also was de developed you know by darpa and the defense department and i know that they were messing around with with the holodeck concept you know you, you know sort of a few years ago is yeah. that is that gone out into the private sector yet or is that still like being worked on in there i haven't heard of any darpa things with this yeah, i had, a, um, I had a, a, a army ranger i did a talk uh, at the gallery and he talked about how it would have been perfect for it to teach how to like do night um, mm -hmm. landings wearing this the headset wow so i think it's yeah. i'm sure they're aware of it yeah you know yeah. if you're ever if you're ever down in san diego uh go to sd uh or ucsd at cal it2 which is an old uh state uh funded program to develop the it industry this is like probably 15 years ago but a lot of heavies from SIGGRAPH came in and they've developed this array of the highest resolution like gigapixel video walls and caves which are the old immersive kind of cubic things you go into which is kind of like a holodeck type of thing. Um, but they have one there called the Star Cave which is by far the, the closest thing to a quote holodeck that I've ever seen. And it's just some phenomenal amount of projectors, you're in this kind of prismatic space but it's all in stereo, so you wear glasses, and one person has a, a hat that has tracking in it, so you have to look where they're looking, otherwise, you know, it's a nausea, but, but, the, uh, but it's just, it, it transports you, even in a sense, you know, more, more realistically than VR, because you're physically, you feel like you're really physically in the space, yeah. and that's a great thing to, uh, so that, that has probably some, some military overtones. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, so, and then uh, the 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 idea of um, of stuff that's created, uh, you know, in an art, let me say, like in, like an artificial setting, and everything that would eventually be retailed or, or, or like. Well, I mean, that's a whole another. I mean, it'd be hilarious to be able to sell like an art object that's in a museum, but that doesn't exist in reality. Yeah, you know, there's a certain site-specific site specific side side of this. You yeah, know, I mean, like if you let's say let's say like you created like a, a Lord of the Rings Hobbiton right. thing. You know, we put this on, and you're in the you're in you know the you know the Hobbit world or something like that, or yeah. Bilbo's house or something. So, so so I guess like you would retail that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's lots of possibilities where you get into that, where you could. I think the, the 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 dystopic side of it was where you could replace like if it was AR you could replace like your wife's face or your husband's face and you didn't <laughs> like the way they looked. Yeah, yeah, there's a great cartoon that somebody sent me the other day, and it's uh, man, husband and wife in the morning reading the paper, and they both have headsets on, and one says, "Good morning, Brad," and the other's like, "Good morning, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Angie?" Or, you know, whatever. So. Funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know when I was when I was writing my book, like a few friends said to me, they said, "Are you going to talk about the contributions of the porn industry?" It's like it's like pushed a lot of CG in its time. Like, like oh, yeah. <laughs> move the technology forward. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of if you look at the the Kickstarter Star Citizen. Have you heard about this? Yeah. So the biggest uh, Kickstarter ever is like ninety seven million there. Oh so, my god! So they're they're selling. They're, I mean, they're basically creating. It's not necessarily connected directly to VR, but they're creating a world that people are invested in, and they're selling sh like uh, spaceships that you, that are not made yet, and that you'll only own in the game, right? So there's just pictures of it, and these spaceships are like some of them are like a thousand, like a thousand dollars, right? So there's and and it, but they're made, they're created. And they're cold, they're 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 nice, you know. They're like you know, people have spent weeks on them, and right? multiple people to make them photorealistic, and special and unique. But they don't exist in reality. And so you could think of maybe there's going to be a blue collar workforce of people that create these objects in in this alternate universe, this alternate reality. You know, and VR 
would just be one way to witness that stuff, you know. And so it gets into this ethical. I, I mean, to me, I think the spaceship's really cool, you know. But I don't know if that's me. I just wondered if any of you have seen the TED talk that Chris Hill did about mm -hmm. using VR as the ultimate entity. Oh yeah, that's the buzzword right now. Yeah, yeah. But which I'm which he actually he appropriated that from a director years ago saying film is the entity machine. But but yeah, but it's uh, but very true. And one thing that happened last weekend, which is a very major turning point in this whole game, is that uh, the New York Times he partnered with, and they released seven million cardboard viewers of the Google Cardboard with the Sunday edition, and it just seeded you know seven million viewers now, created a, an audience of seven million all, all right at once. So that's and I've, I you know even this week I've had friends of mine bring me their headset like do you have can I see your thing in this you know so <laughs> it's like it so it really did work for that I think because yeah. my my curiosity about um, just the motivation behind this is the starting point discussion about educators uh, using technology obviously mm -hmm. is that as well as what you can uh, um, monetize in terms of what you're creating with IP with it that. As, as a tool for teaching and for engaging across continents so that people yeah. are experiencing mm -hmm. the production or the design of the animation process with yeah. the, the immersive technologies yeah. could be used yeah, as, as part of that yeah. process itself. But I, I don't know if that was part of your motivation. Well, yeah, no, it's really, I, I think there's a I8, have you heard of I8? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so yeah, they're creating sure. this kind of interesting, uh, I'm not, I'm not as, uh, are you familiar with the technology? Because mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, maybe you could talk about that, but it's kind of the, using this kind of um, VR setup where it makes you feel like the person is there right next to you and you have this kind of presence and it's this sense of, you know, they're not on TV, you know, and you have this connection that can happen. Because one of the things that always comes back, you know, just repeatedly over the years, people have said, well, now if you're working in animation production and somebody's in Bangalore and somebody's in California, well, surely, you know, you, you can all be co-producing because you've got FaceTime, you've got Skype. When actually the, the beauty when you're in production with people is how much communication is based on something you see by accident over an artist's shoulder on yeah. the way to the water mm -hmm. cooler. Yeah. 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 If you can walk to the water cooler in Bangalore without leaving the Bay Area, you can look over an artist's shoulder and see what's. I just you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. throw that yeah, out yeah. there. Yeah, it's a good point. While you're bumping into your own water cooler because your headset. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. I'll tell you one of the, the greatest <laughs> the greatest things I love about VR because I I show our our demo too we turn it to thousands of people now. And over the last year, and everyone, you know, kind of has a great time for the minute and a half duration. Then they take it off and they go, that was fabulous. And then they get, you know, this like 100 yard stare over your shoulder. And they go, you know, I could use that for this. And everybody's got an application. So if we look at this group, like, you know, if I had the headset here now, we could do the same thing. And like your idea of using it directly for it as an education vehicle is Phenomenal. I mean, there's all kinds of avenues, but I've never seen this in any media type that can be so widely deployed or adapted. You know, it's just it's insane. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. Just a, a little side, but but uh, but just I was thinking the application as a, as, a, as a former storyboard artist, and that is uh, one of the problems that I've had lately with storyboards is that is that storyboard artists like it used to be you would pin everything up on the wall and you sit and you'd look at it and you'd have a conversation about it. And nowadays, our, uh, the board artists are being asked to basically make animatics. And it's a sort of a fat accompli, you know, you got to sit and you have to watch the movie. When a lot of times some of the greatest ideas was just looking at the whole thing. And then, you know, like Jeffrey Katzenberg would see something like three rows down and go, wait a minute, you know, you know, and, you my know, biggest, and that's lost. My biggest argument with colleges where I teach is empty wall space. Yeah. Like what the ugliest thing on a campus is an empty wall when you're dealing with visual arts medium. Right. And if you can create a, a, a wall that... But the issue for a lot of people is that they can't create the kind of space that you would have at DreamWorks or Blue Sky or Disney where you can have all these 8x4 court boards and you pile them up there. But if you do that with VR technology and project stuff, you still have that dynamic where somebody walks in with a tray full of coffee and they go, it's actually funnier if these joints move up to that level and this happens first and then you re-pin everything. And the guys who've been working with uh, the Flix program between Sony and uh, the Foundry, where it's this browser-based uh, thing that the VR applications for that in the boarding process, but in the humanizing process, where you rehumanize the, the remove that you get in so many of the other digital technologies, that you kind of come around full circle and say we can all be in the same room together, 
because a lot of the boarding thing you're discussing is that the first audience experience at the board is 20 people sitting in a conference room yeah. and they behave for the first time like a cinema audience, yeah. which you can't do if you're all looking at it on an iPhone. Yeah. Flix has a projector now that does it. And we tested it, it's pretty great. Yeah. Uh, so oh, I don't think we're going to use it, but you should know, Tom, we've gone back to paper boards. So okay. Jeffrey asked for that. Okay. And we are now pinning boards with dialogue strips because <laughs> that experience has gone wrong. Sounds <laughs> great. So you should know that we have had some poor little PA is getting the thumbnail. Oh, no. And then we're stuck yeah. in there. Yeah. Nail bed. Right now. Yeah, I was at Warner's and they had this weird kind of like half and half thing yeah. where it's like where it's like you drew everything on Photoshop, you made the animatic, then a, a production person would print it out and print it all up anyway and still stick it on the wall. So it's kind of yeah. I mean, I think yeah. for the early time, definitely. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask sort of that old, uh, uh, question that an old school person would ask who just can't quite see the change. So the thing that made me want to be an animator was the ability to tell a story about a world that didn't exist and bring people into that story. And I've already sort of, you know, lived with my kids being the game generation who don't want the storyteller to be in control of the story, but you still have to create that world and tell that story. And and my curiosity is, you know, okay, how do how does that fantasy element where where the auteur gets to create a visual story world uh, uh, then transfer into a VR environment? Have we lost the narrative talking about storyboarding? Do we lose the narrative strand as we move into VR as the big media, you know, the, well, the media in the room is VR yeah. and you cannot depend that the person is going to be looking at or paying attention to any part of right. the story that you yeah. think is critical. So well, that's sort of, to me, I to, I'm trying to teach animation. Is what I'm trying to teach not going to be useful in five years? And that's what I'm trying to think about. Well, there's, there's definitely new techniques. Like in cinema, we have the jump cut. We have like, you know, editorial, where the eyes are, where it's location. And I think those are things that we're going to need to think about. Yeah, a lot of a lot of what we know falls away, unfortunately. Yeah, um, I think so. Because this really is kind of a whole new media, so it's the rules haven't really been adopted yet. So everybody, like we've learned a lot of different things about how not to make someone nauseous, but from a story level, there's several Chris Milk and others that are kind of exploring. Yeah, that. but um, yeah, because you can't you can't cut rapidly. It's way too jarring. So you're, but it's a more immersive. You know, and the way you relate to uh, talent has changed too. So there's less objectification. It's more, it's, it's interpersonal now because, you know, I would see you in that exact mm -hmm. scale, sitting this exact distance away, and it just it it changes everything. So yeah, a lot of the the concerns are the same, but the techniques are going to have to be reevaluated. Yeah, I kind of feel like cinematic language that went with film is going to not apply well across I think the it's cut. true. Well, yeah. And I'm imagining that it's more like that theater experience where, you know, you show up at a house and you get embedded in a, you know, oh, no. an Agatha Christie <laughs> mystery. <laughs> and, and, and the people are all um, really great improvisational actors, so they just go you know, with whatever the audience brings through yeah. the story. Um, and and then your goal becomes to somehow deal with visual language and with performance and with human curiosity and personality to get them to go enough of your path that your story doesn't just fall apart. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that some trickster doesn't come in and completely destroy the play. Well, that, that's why education plays in all this, because there are no directors working in the field right now. There's hardly any. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chris Milk, to some extent, Felix and Paul, we're working with those guys, and they're, they're by far the most sensitive to where this is going to go. But even then, I don't think, you know, any of the key figures have arrived yet. So they're going to come out of our... Our systems, and, I think, right. and there's yeah. lots of possible. I mean, it's in a way, like things are falling away, but new things are popping up. You know, so for example, like in the show, at the museum, there's a there's a moment when 
you, you put on the headset and there's the plinth that you took the headset off is there in VR, but there's nothing else there. And so you start to like wonder, what, what am I supposed to do? And you turn around and you see this object behind you and you kind of find it, right? And then all of a sudden there's a cut and it's like you're right in front of the object. So there's this kind of almost like a, your consciousness has jumped and it becomes very, a lot of people described it similar to like horror where you get this fear and this dread that can happen. And so there's a lot of, I think, possibilities there, but there's also a lot of things that we're starting to see, you know, maybe that's a little bit too much. Yeah, it's interesting to me because, uh, I mean, if it, it, even though the Hobbit movies seem interminable when you're watching them anyway, if you actually had to do that in a VR environment and you couldn't employ the, the truncation of time that we've, we've perfected in film so that we can tell you know, a, a, a 10 year story in a two and a half hour film and people accept that the time sequence worked. And we, are we losing that? That's kind of the yeah, interesting let's hope point it, it's, to me. It translates somehow rather than is lost. I mean, it mutates rather than yeah. being lost is what I would hope. In a way, you, it's like you could think you have somebody's brain, like this box around their brain. And if you move it around, you're like literally moving the person around, like in a 2D movie. Uh -huh. In a 3D movie, you kind of do that a little bit, but in a 2D movie, you can really, you can do it, nobody gets sick. But when you have it in <laughs> VR, in this volume, it's really, you. The, the whole worry about getting people sick is definitely there, you know, and you have to I, do... I to say I get sick in Cinerama movies, so I'd be <laughs> in major trouble. Yeah. No, yeah. I definitely agree with what you said, Dory. Like, you know, with CG animation, especially when it's 3D, you just get, you get a bit nauseous. That's what you're saying. I do. In 2D animation, it's just very simple. Mm -hmm. There's no way you get very nauseous about it. But what's, what's interesting is, is, is to think that, like, we are at the, at the Lumiere Edison stage of this technology, and we're basically training the Frank Capras and the, and the John Fords and the Alfred Hitchcocks to come. Who will make something yeah. like this? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's gonna take a while to make yeah, sure. It really feels that way. Yeah. I mean, I had, I'll tell you this over the summer, like I've been examining all the story aspects, but and I don't know what the answer is myself, but I did wake up in this fevered dream over the summer. <laughs> and it's like one of those ones where literally I was sweating. I woke up, I was like, oh my well, God, that was so vivid. And it was, I was experiencing a David Fincher film in VR. And it was like a little bit of Gun Girl, a little bit of Seven or something, but I was this disembodied observer kind of, you know, floating about the characters. And it was fascinating. I just thought, well, that's what it's going to be like, you know. In the early days of widescreen, they stopped editing as rapidly. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah, because it was too and the, it was And then all of a sudden now, the amount of editing in a film is much greater than right. ever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, audiences. It's it's a. I I I heard an interesting interview once with um, a guy who was an editor for Stanley Kubrick, and he said he said if you took a modern movie and got in a time machine, and went to 1945 and ran it, audiences would be like ah ah. ah. It was like <laughs> <running> screaming <laughs> from the theater. Well, H. L. Mencken famously wrote seeing early D. W. Griffith biograph films. <laughs> Films all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, it's, yeah. Well, I was wondering if anybody had spoken to Margaret Livingston at Harvard. She did this amazing book called Vision and uh, Art, the Biology of Seeing. Because it strikes me that so much of this is about what Walter Murch identified, which was that the language of film editing is the language of how we see, that it's our attempt mechanically to reproduce the way we edit what we experience anyway. So the idea of the endless shot or the mm -hmm. gaming camera that is never interrupted by a cut really it's a transition what made me think about this was that i was asked to give a talk uh in, in bath in the uk and they asked for a title for the talk and i asked if it would be cheesy to call it all the world's a screen because <laughs> our relationship to the screen image to the moving image is so radically different now because while i'm lecturing all the kids are they're they're on a device while I'm talking to them, not so that they're messaging their friends, but the minute I mention something, if I mention Margaret Livingston, they don't know the book, they find it, they tag it, they go back to it. Um, but the idea that you introduce a new visual opportunity doesn't mean you throw away the old visual language necessarily, because are we not just going to gravitate to how we make sense of the 
visual information, which is what Margaret Livingston's career is based on. I just wondered if anybody's talking to her, because she's that, that whole idea that when you talk to students about why certain things work in terms of color or in terms of speed of an edit or movement of a camera, it is at the fundamental level how the visual cortex processes the information that reaches it through the optic nerve from the retina. But what goes into the retina is we're already editing walking through Times Square or walking through yeah. uh, Piccadilly Circuits. And people are, are far more discerning, I think, about finding key information in a constant avalanche of visual information anyway. So is this not something we're in the middle of solving anyway because of the, 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 the ubiquitous nature of the moving image and the competing moving images? Maybe. Well, thinking that uh, you remind me of this an anecdote, but uh, someone reporter once asked the film director John Houston, uh, "How do you know? How do you know where to put your cuts? Like, how do you know where, where to cut?" And Houston goes, "Turn completely around." And he goes, "What?" Well, goes, "Turn around 360 degrees." And he goes, "Okay." He goes, "Did you blink?" He goes, "Yeah." He goes, "That's where I cut." <laughs> 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 okay. So effectively, yeah. we are cutting. Yeah, yeah, we're making yeah. edits. So, you know, uh, it, it changes. Kind of, yeah, but it's like, actually, but, uh, I mean, in, in the work that I'm doing, I'm not cutting any. The fastest cut I'll do is 30 seconds. So it's it's really lengthy. I mean, I would love to, hearing you speak of this, I'd love to go back to like uh, Children and Men with Curon's long take and experience that in VR and see if the same devices of, you know, drawing the attention works spherically. I think it would actually. Because when I was, I was but, doing the, the, the book about layout and talking to yeah. him about camera, when I was talking to Lee Unkrich, I wanted to talk to him because he's an editor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I was asking right. what, what he felt because a great many people were very uh, sort of prickly about the idea that the, the new generation of kids who their visual language for camera was the gaming environment. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't care. They're the new generation. It's their, they're their movies. If, it's, if they're introducing a new language, bring it on. Let's, you know, because when mm -hmm. they were creating the kind of facilities that you also have at DreamWorks where you go into a world with the director and you, you recce a set and you go out and you scout for locations of where you're going to put the camera. It, it, th these are just things that kids don't need to, they, they don't worry about it. They just come in and they, they engage with the technology and they use it and they, the older generation always frets about, you're going to undo everything we've worked for all our lives. They're not, they're good because they have the same brains and the same visual cortex we have and the same craving for the narrative to make well, sense. The, the good thing is I'm, I'm not a gamer, but I, I, I know a few and they all don't, they're actually not that interested in VR and I don't necessarily make the connotation of VR to gaming that the common press or public might make. Um, it in no way feels like gaming to me. But, and as I say, the gamers that I know say, no, I don't, I don't want that immersive world. I, I want, you know, a, uh, a screen. So I didn't for certain reasons, but um, but I think yeah I think it, it's actually closer to film than gaming <clears throat> at least cinematic VR. There's well, this to me is like role playing games pretty much try to do the, what the VR trend like mm -hmm. supposed to do, and the, of course they have their own tricks of how they like when you're doing like the, like Fallout Four just came out, mm -hmm. you're just in a massive world kind of walking around, like animation of course you're so. And I mean, stuff that I mean, a perfectly good, like, uh, saying they're characters that really don't do anything except tell you information. That's where I, I kind of saw where, like, the movie would, or, like, the movie kind of would move more into that area where you direct your people through other characters into the direction of what you want. They're, they're trying to do, like, a submersive movie with, with VR to do. But I saw this perfectly as, a, like, all the role playing games, which are, they pay a lot of money. Some people pay subscriptions to play these games. And I love, a lot of people love to do like just submerge themselves into World of Warcraft, into these other games where you, a lot of times you're just walking around. Of course, they have devices where you can move from map, map areas to map areas, but I think it's perfectly for that. Like the VR, that's what I understand where I can send some gamers where they don't want like shooting just to be like, or unless they, they enjoy like all the really quick movements of a. Of uh, like shooting games, because those are I can see that being too disjarring in a VR setting, but I really feel like that's why I'm like I think this more as a video game and kind of introducing like uh, the role playing game video games like the language into like movie language, they can like know kind of how to like direct people in the in a giant environment where 
you're literally free to go wherever you want. That's what I kind of see like the VR with gaming more. And it reminds me of like an anime that's really popular right now, where the whole thing is that they put on a, a VR yeah, set, yeah, yeah. and they're of course it's it's more futuristic, but they're literally. And it's kind of weird when you're watching the anime because once you see them physically like get out, and they're kind of like, I feel like the VR world is more of my real world than yeah. than the than the real world is. So it's. I mean, is I mean, I guess maybe it's a certain sense of embarrassment too. To, it's like if you play video games a lot and, and you put the headset on and you wear it, you know, maybe they're a little bit sensitive to how they look. You know, like with that age group, you know, with video games and you know, like I, I'd I'd be curious to see how much of um, people are avoiding VR simply because of the size of the apparatus and how it looks. You know, and then wearing it for, you know, video games, most people play it for hours and hours, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, could you even do that without damaging our eyes? I know? think people don't even blink, like, oh wait, I need a blink, you know, the screen too much. it's got to be something, wrong yeah. Yeah. something that is very useful, like, making sure that there's not so affected to the radiation sense you have wearing the, the VR, mm -hmm. I would think about wearing there is, I wonder if there's got to be a way to uh, make sure to to invent VR to let you uh, look at the VR goggles for like for hours and hours and hours. I wonder if there's an invention to do that. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if the I don't know if you know, the, the of studies. You know, we went about a year ago. We went around VRLA and we started asking everyone who does this, you know, full time. And what's the longest you wear a headset for? And most everybody said, eh, you know, I can't do more than thirty minutes. At a time, it's so just so we kind of, it, So I think it kind of lends itself to short form. Yeah. Are they even gamers, or they were all? Specific? Well, but I don't know. But that being said, Emirates Airlines now offers it in first class for an alternate to watching film. So you know, you know, that's that's probably the best case study to look at. See how those passengers are holding up. You know, <laughs> yeah. before before we get too late, because um, I know that we're like kind of about another ten minutes. Um, I'm just curious. I just wanted to touch on. Uh, just as educators, like, uh, uh, how would you approach teaching VR? Yeah. Well, we, uh, for me, um, we haven't started teaching yet. So it's something that it's like on the horizon. Um, and I think probably um, Eric could probably, because you're teaching it already. Yeah, but I'm taking, I mean, we have, I have a very unique way of doing it, which is actually somewhat simplistic if you know Maya. So that's, and we, and I'm doing everything I can to support, you know, the use of Maya in our program. So that's the way, the, the road that I've taken. The easiest thing to do would be, if you really just want to explore <coughs> storytelling, would be, uh, there's a thing called a Ricoh Theta, which is about a $300 360 camera. And it's not very high resolution, but it takes all the technical aspect out of it. And I could just place it on the table and it'll upload to my cell phone, like, immediately, and I could put a headset on. So it's a very, it's a rapid fire way of kind of exploring filmmaking with VR. So it would probably involve that too. But like I say, for animation students, I'm taking them through Maya because it's a, and I, again, I teach them spherical photography, <clears throat> which is a very rapid way of acquiring the world, a world, and then modifying it. So that's kind of my approach, but it's, it's probably a little oddball compared to others. Um, like I say, the interactive media division at our school is all about real time. So Unity, but I don't, I don't yeah, play I mean, if you had a, a game areas. program or you, you could tap into it pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. If you had a game engine already created. Yeah. But the dome, uh, for live action, the dome way is definitely the first way to go. Mm -hmm. I think also, uh, just, before, just a little side, but before uh, we go to general questions, uh, um, I just want to acknowledge too the, the fact that like, although this is a smaller group, I think last year we were on a Saturday and we had like standing room here. Yeah. So I think it's because it's a Friday. When I can, but, but what's great is that, you know, we've got educators from Norway, educators from Texas, educators from the Bay Area. Uh, uh, are there any, which were, any folks from out of town from anything interesting? Or, uh, and then we're all like in the area, Southern yeah. California. Too. Georgia. <laughs> Georgia, yeah, cool, Harvard, cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Harvey was teaching in Atlanta before. He was from Norway. So, what you I'm French? actually from Scotland, but I'm teaching in Norway at the moment. And oh, I'm talking about that. Actually. I have a couple of the educators from Norway with me who are cool. very keen to get on camera 
um, discussions with other educators in the field of animation, games, and virtual reality. And if I could speak to you afterwards sure. before they disappear, I'd love to. Okay. Yeah, I used to run a, an event up there called Digital Storytelling. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, you know, Frieder wrote that excellent book, uh, uh, which was setting the stage, the thing about layout and stuff, which which, which I really like. Yeah. So, with help cool. from Harvey and a great many other people who yeah. were kind enough to share their knowledge and expertise, yeah. it, was, it was a great experience getting to meet with those people. Right. So, does anybody have any general questions or things you want to throw out? So. I don't know if anybody else has read it, but uh, I haven't gotten all the way through it yet. It's one of those things you start reading and put it down. I don't know if any of you guys have heard the fictional account of education. It's called the Ready Player One. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Happens. It's in production, yeah. Yeah, yeah I yeah. thought it was being Spielberg. Did you see it going that way? Right? The book's kind of, the parts that I've gotten to are kind of frightening, where the main <laughs> character is a poor boy who has to hide in order to be able to get into the virtual world where he can be himself. All his, the, the students are in a classroom, they're virtual. They have an yeah. avatar, they raise their hand, they interact yeah. with the teacher, yeah. and, and all that. But, I'm not. I can see it opening up things, but I can also see the Microsoft coming in and saying, "You have to buy this. This is how you get into it." Yeah, sure. But has anybody else read it? Yeah. Read it yeah. I've had people. I've had a discussion. Oh, people. It's the you got to read this book. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's where it's at. Mm -hmm. It's a crazy book. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's some production. It's, yeah. mm -hmm. it's definitely I think it's a virtual reality no, story yeah. with Oh, story. I guarantee yeah, yeah, what's yeah. happening too. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's something that I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah, has anybody thought of like tying like what is that 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 those those things where you have your synthetic like with a second life or a, a yeah. avatar or something like, like that kind of stuff? Yeah, we have an avatar of yourself and 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 you know you walk around the Louvre or something like that. Well, it's coming again, but let's yeah. let's hope it's not as awful as that one. Yeah, you can look at the dystopian like the half glass full. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there was I, that movie with Bruce Willis. Uh, surrogates. Yeah, surrogates. Yeah, yeah. Surrogates, yeah, yeah where yeah. it's like uh, yeah. the people that are just going to the room yeah. put on these. It's like it's a chair, and they send out their robot. That, wow. that was the, the idea was that the, the robot was originally a combat robot. Yeah. Uh, it would die. They'll send another one instead of sending soldiers. But then it came for production for everyday use, yeah. and people would just use that to communicate yeah. the world. Yeah, because a lot of stuff did come through the military. I mean, yeah. a lot of the first game engines and all the flight simulators. You know, it was all stuff that the military was was spending money on in the sixties. You know, then it, then it moved to the private sector. The scenario was based on flight simulators. What's that? Scenario. Oh yeah, yes, it's on a flight set. Yeah, yeah. So. Did you see the Walking Dead VR? Yeah. Come come. Yeah. They, they brought it to work, and so it's yeah. a trailer. And I was thinking what you're saying about putting on the headset, so you're feeling self-conscious. Yeah. But this was an RV where you got into it, and you sat in a chair. It was really cleverly done. It was great storytelling because there was a person behind you. Your character was in a wheelchair, so you sat in a wheelchair, and you were trying to escape the zombies. Yeah. The person behind you was a live experience. They were driving you. You felt this. You were holding a gun and you were trying to kill zombies. There were three other people doing it at once. So everyone's laughing and just killing zombies. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was about ten minutes, and it was a terrific social experience. Yeah, yeah so that's really cool. But it, I feel like the self-conscious part went away because you were in this room that was meant for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it was a little really bit. Cool. There were only so many people in it. Yeah. And it was short form, but it was a great story. I mean, yeah. it, it they used all of the the constraints to end up in this place where yeah. you know. Dude, it was great. I thought it was terrific. But you know, when I when I first showed my daughters uh, my headset, they said, you know, Daddy, you know what I want to do? I get One Direction and have them all like come around the camera and hug, and it'll be like they're hugging me, <laughs> and, I'll get, and I'll get my friends to hug me, and it'll be like I'm really being hugged by them. So, great idea. Uh, somebody will do it. Yeah, yeah. I could, I could, I could, I could live my dream to be a pole dancer. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not sure I'd buy that. But. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to comment and to say that uh, with VR, it's like as long as the once the tools become <coughs> readily affordable, uh, but also the tools to be able to author within it um, be, become easy to use, I think that's when we're going to see uh, an explosion of creative work that's going to be made available. Think about uh, when, like, say, for example, on Apple, when they released iMovie. Now, all of a sudden, you had digital filmmakers everywhere telling yeah. their own stories. Yeah. Uh, where we, before, it was a high barrier of entry. Uh, and also, in regards to VR, 
uh, it's not going to be a matter of trying to fit traditional movies into VR, traditional games into VR. It's going to be probably some 16-year-old who just has lots more time than we do yeah. and <laughs> creating things, and they're going to create the new oh, experience using this new storytelling format. Yeah. It's, it's not going to be, it's like, okay, sit down here and watch a movie. It might be yeah. something that has yet to be invented that we have not come up with. So it's, I, I feel that's where we're going to go towards and yeah. try yeah, to, it's like, okay, we're going to have to follow. Are we done? Okay. Yeah. Well, great. No, that's okay. That's good. Well, thank you, everybody. This was a terrific conversation. And I want to thank our guests for coming and stuff.